The title of the presentation today is looking at President Truman and the ending of the war in Japan. Let me introduce myself before we get too far into the presentation. Um, I'm Mark Adams, Education Director here at the Truman Library and Museum. I've worked here 21 years since uh, 1997 and serve as the Education Director here running all of our educational programs which about 30,000 students use our educational programs annually. We're in Independence, Missouri, which is about 20 miles east of Kansas City. So we're kind of in the Kansas City metropolitan area. And Independence is where Harry Truman went to school, grew up, got married, became president, and then came back to live in, Missouri, in Independence, Missouri, just four blocks from here in the Truman home run by the National Park Service, one of our partners today. The Presidential Library here in Independence is run by the National Archives, also one of the partners here today. And if you participated in some of the other programs, you may well have had programs by other National Park Service and National Archives sites. I'm gonna to switch to a PowerPoint and then come back to me here in a second so you can see some of the information. Let's hope our technology works okay for us today. There we go, you should see a PowerPoint on the screen. and. Um, the title of the presentation and my title, and then with the magic of technology, we can beam this PowerPoint directly to your classroom. So just to tell you a little bit about the background of the presentation, and then shortly after that, I'm going to have you weigh in on a few things, some of the primary sources we have available here at the Truman Library. And that's what I want to talk about first about this presentation. The photograph on the right is of our building here in Independence, our Truman, Truman Library. Truman Presidential Library Museum, and you see the big banners on the columns of our building. We have two floors of exhibits on Truman's life and times and on Truman's presidency. And as I mentioned already, we're about 20 minutes east of Kansas City, so right in the heart of the nation in Truman's hometown. Truman himself raised the money and built the building in 1957 and actually worked here until about 1972. So those people that visit our museum exhibits can see the office he worked in until he died in 1972. Today, we're gonna to be looking at just one aspect of his decision-making, and that is how to end the war in Japan. We're gonna look at some options that he faced, look at some of the positives and the negatives of those options, and to look at the considered decision that he had to make at that time in 1945. Before we do that, we're gonna do a little bit of background just to kind of get us all on the same page and get us up to speed. So I'm gonna show you this photograph to get us started and talk some about Truman's background before we get into the decision um, that faced him uh, later in 1945. This photograph is taken uh, April 12, 1945. Um, this is when he transitions from being vice president to president. That day is the day that FDR died, Roosevelt dies, Truman is vice president and he becomes president on Roosevelt's death as vice president. Truman had been a senator for 10 years, senator from Missouri for 10 years, and prior to that, he'd been a county legislator, like a county commissioner, in the late 20s and early 30s, and then became a U.S. senator from Missouri in 1934 and served as the U.S. senator from Missouri for 10 years until he became vice president after the 1944 election. He was actually only vice president for 82 days, so just three months in that time, he only met FDR twice. And we'll be talking about that uh, here in a while. Prior to that, prior to being a county commissioner in the 20s and 30s, he served in World War I. He was a captain in World War I and fought in France in 1917 and 1918. So 100 years ago, at the, right about this time, Truman enlisted. Uh, he was not drafted, he volunteered. Um, before the draft, and he would have been too old for the draft anyway, and served as a captain in World War I. And before that, he served 11 years as a farmer, so he had a lot of variety of background. We're going to dig in to look at this decision he faced. I'm going to put up one document. I know it's going to be very difficult to read, so I'm probably going to read it to you, but it's such a key document. I want you to look at it 
And remember the date here as we look at it. So this photograph is taken April 12th. So that's when he becomes president. Let's take a look at this first document and I'll talk through it and then uh, maybe we can glean some information from that. So first of all, when we're looking at a document, we want to look at the date. So I'm going to ask, and I know the resolution might not be the best, but can anybody find the date from either school? Just yell that out. If you can find the date of this letter to Pre President Truman, can anybody read that date? Anybody got a magnifying glass and can see the date at the top of the page? Unmute if you have to. I hear that a April 24th, 1945. So it's at least clear enough for you to read that part. I don't expect you to be able to necessarily read the whole letter. I did want to tell you before I go too much further, all of the doc. First off, I'm going to share the PowerPoint that I'm sharing today with the teachers afterwards. But the second thing is we have, and you may have discovered this already, thousands and thousands of documents on the Truman Library website. And all of the documents I'm showing you today can be found on the Truman Library website, just so that you're aware of that. Uh, I'm gonna read this, and I don't usually do that, but because it's such an important letter, I feel like you should see it. So April 24th, 1945, and when we said on the previous photograph, he became president on April 12th, 45. So this is just 12 days after he's become president, 12 days. Dear Mr. President, I think it's very important that I should have a talk with you as soon as possible on a highly secret matter. I mentioned to you shortly after you took office, and I, but have not urged it since on, amount, on the amount of pressure you've been under. It, however, has such a bearing on our present foreign relations and has such an important effect on, upon all my thinking in this field that I think you should know about it without much further delay. Faithfully yours. And then let me read that signature. It's Henry Stimson, that scribbly writing, <laughs> and he's Secretary of War, and he sent this to President Truman. Then there's some handwriting on the bottom, and the handwriting on the bottom says Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, and that's Matthew Conley, one of Truman's secretaries, his appointment secretary. And this is Harry Truman's handwriting. Put on list tomorrow, Wednesday the 25th, HST. So you can see some interesting notations up on the right. It says saw 42545. So that means he saw Henry Stimson the next day. So they discussed whatever this secret matter is. So I'm going to turn that to uh, the middle school. I think we have a middle school and a high school. Am I correct? So let's turn to the middle school first. Any of the middle school students want to guess? Who, what both this secret matter might be. They're both middle schools. They're both middle schools. I apologize. Um, well, whoever was speaking, go ahead, go first. I'm, I'm shooting in the dark a little here. So go ahead and take a stab. But what do you think this secret matter is that the Secretary of War wants to talk to the President about? Any ideas? April 25th, what do you think? The bomb. The bomb. Oh, the bomb. Right. So he wants to talk to him about, and it's not necessarily the bomb itself yet, but it is about that project. What's the name of that project? Do you know? Manhattan Project. Manhattan Project. You guys are great. So this is a telling him about the Manhattan Project. Anything about that that surprises you? Why would that, why, anything about that, that that would surprise you? Get shouting, you guys, don't get it. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? They said no. no. Nothing, nothing. So he's been, he's been president 12 days and he's receiving this letter. Think again, anything from either group that might surprise you about that? He's been vice president for three months and now he's president for 12 days. Anything that might be surprising? <clears throat> Do you think he would have, should have known about this already? He's, this is April. He's been vice president since January. And then he's been president since April the 12th. Thank you. 
wouldn't you would you not think he would know about this when he was vice president? Same out of percentage that Clinton having been vice president for a long period of time. They're saying yes, he should have known better. He should have known better. He should have known about it, right? Well, a couple of things here, and, he, and in today's world, I think the vice president would be has a different role than vice president in the 1940s, maybe. The other part of it is that FDR's, Roosevelt's style of leadership, he tend to have his close advisors around him, and that usually did not include the vice president. I think to me, what's surprising, it takes them 12 days to tell him even when he is president, because he has so much going on when he first becomes president. It's a shock, it's a surprise. It's not like there's been an election. Nobody. People would, didn't expect Roosevelt to see out the fourth term, but they thought he would last longer than, than three months. So this is where he finds out about the Manhattan Project. We still don't have an actual bomb yet, but they're working on it, and they're getting really close to testing it, and we're going to come to that part next. But this is when Truman first finds out about the existence of the Manhattan Project itself. So I want you to kind of think of a time frame here this is April the 24th when he gets the letter. He meets Stimson the next day, so he finds out about it April the 25th. By early August, he's authorizing the decision to drop the atomic bomb. So it's not too much time is going to pass during that late spring and summer. One of the things he has to deal with, what is happening in Europe at this time, the end of April and the early part of May, question for either school. What is happening in Europe at the end of April, early part of May in 1945? I'm testing your history a little bit here. What happens in, in early May in 1945 in Europe? <laughs> if a teacher could repeat that for me. VE Day. VE Day, absolutely, which means the surrender in Europe, right? Germany surrenders on May 8th. VE Day is exactly right. That just happens to be Harry Truman's birthday, May the 8th, 1945. So shortly after this, Germany surrenders, and Truman has to go meet with the other world leaders to figure out what to do with a defeated Germany. So that's the next source we're going to look at. So this is known as the Big Three. In the Potsdam Conference in July, the surrender had taken place in, in May. Truman actually sails by boat to Germany. I mean, he gets to, goes to France and then takes the train across to Germany to meet with these two other world leaders. Who are they? Who's, who's he sitting with? Who is, who is Truman? I mean, Truman is in the center of the photograph. Who are the two other leaders that he's meeting with in Potsdam? No guesses? Stalin is one of them. Which one is it? Stalin on the left or the right? He's on the right in the white jacket. And who's on the left? Winston Churchill. What's interesting about that is if you look at some of the photographs of this conference, uh, Winston Churchill is not in the photographs at the end of the conference. He actually loses the British election during the conference. So if you ever get confused about that in a textbook or something, you will see that uh, Churchill is replaced by Clement Attlee halfway through the conference. But this is where he goes to meet with them to discuss what to do with Germany at the end of the war and a number of other issues as well. What's interesting for our topic today in the ending of the war in Japan, they're also discussing what to do about Japan, whether Russia is going to, whether the Soviet Union is going to get involved and also invade Japan now that the war in Europe is over. While they are there, something very important happens. I'm going to let you look at that for a moment. And we're going to talk about it. So this is a sketch. It tells you on the top left of the first ever explosion of an atomic bomb in New Mexico in July of 1945. This takes place while Truman is in Germany meeting with Stalin and with Churchill. 
So a really momentous occasion changes history. And you can see there, there's cloud drawings. I know some of the writing is a little difficult. I want to remind you, this document is actually online. Um, you can search for Leslie Gross report. It's a 14 page report. This sketch is on the very last page. And in very, very tiny writing where it says cloud drawings, it says these sketches were taken from a B-29 flying at 30,000 feet. So that's pretty amazing primary source that you can see there, where you can see um, the describing dark brown clouds. In the written report itself, in the 14-page report, which is actually very, very readable, it's not too difficult to read, it's very informal in many ways, uh, Leslie Groves refers to a mushroom cloud. It's the first time that that phrase is used, and it's in that document that he sends to Henry Stimson. Truman receives this information from Henry Stimson while he's in Germany, and so they tell him it's been very successful. They describe the amount of material. How do we know that? Let's look at the next document. And I know this one is going to be too difficult to read, but I think it's such a powerful document because this is Truman's own handwriting, and this is his diary entry from July the 25th, 1945. What I want to draw your attention to, and I know it's hard to read, um, this is why we have archivists and museum curators to help us interpret the information. So we have experts on staff here at the library who can read Truman's handwriting very easily. I do want to draw your attention to the second paragraph, though, uh, where it says, um, this weapon is to be used against Japan between now and August 10th. Now, this is July 25th, 1945. Truman's already made the decision. Truman's already made the decision. This weapon is going to, is to be used against Japan between now and August 10th. So they've been waiting for the successful test to be done so they know they can use the, the new weapon. It says, I have told the Secretary of War, Mr. Stimson, to use it so that military objectives and soldiers are the target and not women and children. And it goes on. And it talks towards the bottom about the power of the weapon. And it says it's towards the four lines from the bottom. It is certainly a good thing for the world that Hitler, um, Hitler's crowd or Stalin did not discover this at an atomic bomb. It seems to be the most terrible thing ever discovered. And he said, but if we can, if it can be made, uh, what he really goes on to say on the next page, it can be made to get the Japanese surrender, it'll be worth it. Truman had two aims at this point. He wanted to end the war as quickly as possible. In Europe, it had been going on since 1939. In the United States, it had been going on since 1941. We're now in late July of 1945. Truman's main aim was to end the war as quickly as possible. And his second goal was to save American lives. No other lives, just American lives. So those are his two goals. Over the years, people have looked back at this decision to use this new weapon, and they've kind of considered that Truman had four options. And so that's going to be the bulk of what we're going to look at for the rest of the time here. Let's look at what these options are. The so Truman's options were to continual, continue conventional bombing of Japanese cities, which they've been doing to have a land invasion of Japan, so send in troops onto the Japanese mainland, to demonstrate the bomb on an uninhabited island, or finally the fourth one, which we know, which is what he ended up doing, is to drop the bomb on an, on an inhabited Japanese city, so one that had a population. So we're gonna look at the first two. So the first two, continue conventional bombing, and land invasion of Japan. So what I want you to consider, and some of this you can do, we're going to do an exercise now, but this is something that you can continue on in the next few weeks, maybe look at some of the materials on the Truman Library website and other websites that provide you even more primary sources. But what I want you to do is not necessarily decide on, what, on the right course of action or, the, or what you think would have been the best course of action, but just to weigh the pros and cons. What are the advantages of this option? 
what are the disadvantages of this option? So let's start with the first one, thinking of uh, where the, our goal is to end the war as quickly as possible and to save American lives. Those are Truman's goals. So this first option to continue conventional bombing, what would be um, either advantages or disadvantages of that particular option? Anybody want to help me out there from either school? Continuing conventional bombing, what, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of that option? And if maybe, if maybe the students could tell the teacher and then the teacher relay to me, because I'm getting a lot of feedback. No American lives lost. I think I got part of that. Something about lives lost? No American lives lost. No American lives lost. Okay, very good. What are the uh, advantages or disadvantages? <laughs> We're wasting resources. <laughs> wasting resources. I'm sorry, say one more time. The disadvantage of wasting resources. Okay, so the resources involved. Any other, any other advantages or disadvantages of this particular approach? The tend to bomb a stack. One more time. The tend to bomb a stack. They make bombers back, is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, very good. Anything else? Think about um, Truman's goals. We mentioned the American lives. What about ending the war? Would it end the war quickly? No. no, no, probably, probably not. We've, they've been doing this for a while, right? They've been doing this already. So it may not lead to the end of the war quickly. It might drag on, but certainly um, that, was a, that was certainly an approach, probably this, in some ways the most modest or safest approach to continue to do that. Let's move to the second one. We're going to have four of these all together. So the second one is on the right side where you can see this map. I want to explain this map, actually. This is from the, the map room in the White House, and this is showing actual, they did have plans for a land invasion of Japan, so this was certainly discussed. So for a land invasion of Japan, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of that? Don't be shy. A lot of people could die. There could, be, there, could, there could certainly be a lot of American casualties, right? They've taken other islands in the, previously, <laughs> Okawana and Iwo Jima, and suffered heavy casualties. So there could be there could be high casualties. What else? <laughs> Any other advantages or disadvantages? You certainly touched on the biggest disadvantage in that it would certainly, um, you'd have American casualties. What else can you think of? Would it end the war quickly? Can you please restate the question of the uh, so computer just buffer? So we're, what we're doing here is looking at the advantages and disadvantages of each option. So we're looking at the land invasion of Japan on the right side of the screen. What are the advantages and disadvantages of that particular option? So we brought, go ahead. Can I end the war quickly? You think it would? It'd be probably quicker than the conventional bombing, for sure. Okay. Anything else? Ice. 
You guys have touched on the main ones there, the fact that there could be more American casualties, certainly more than the first option. It's good to have these two options side by side. The first option, there would be less threat to American lives. The second option, there would be more threat. The first option would be a slower um, end to the war. If this land invasion is successful, then that might be a slightly faster approach. Um, I'm going to come back to this one later. I've got some extra information I want to provide on this one, but I'm going to try and get through all four options. So don't let me forget that later on. Let me get to option three and four. Three comes up a lot more now with uh, historians and people looking back, and that is to demonstrate the bomb on an island where there was no population so that the Japanese could see the devastation. So that one's brought up more. It was discussed at the time, um, not for very long. And we'll talk about that here in a second of why they thought that. But what would be the initial advantage or disadvantage of demonstrating a bomb on an island with no population nearby? What would be an advantage of that or disadvantage? I can't, like, say it loud, I, I can't hear you. Could somebody repeat that, please? <laughs> <laughs> Japan may think they don't have the guts to do it on their own city. Could you say it one more time? I apologize. Japan may think they don't have the guts to do it on, on their own city or that they're too afraid to do so. Okay, so they wouldn't necessarily be convinced, okay, because they would, didn't have the guts to do it on, this, on their city, okay. What else? What would be an advantage? No casualties at all. No casualties at all, right? Excellent. No casualties at all. Shows the power of the weapon. Maybe, maybe that will convince surrender. What else? Think outside the box now. I'm really going to stretch you. Think outside the box. What would the Americans worry that the Japanese might do? Make their own. Make their own. Make their own. Make their own. Yeah, that's a good thought. They'd make, they might make their own. Who had... Um, well, let me try and... I'm trying not to give you the answer. <laughs> um, what what Americans were in that area? What Americans were in Japan and in the in the Japanese islands? Who was already there? Uh, the prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. So what would the Americans worry that the prisoners of war would would happen to the prisoners of war? Uh, they might be executed. They might be executed or related to this island. Oh. The worry, but the worry by the military was that the Japanese would actually move the prisoners of war onto the island before the bomb was used. So once they said, hey, we're going to drop this bomb on Island X so you can see it, they were worried that the prisoners of war might be moved there because prisoners of war had been murdered in Japan, and Truman references that quite a bit. So they were worried about that. A couple of other pieces of kind of factual information I have not relayed to you at this point. By the beginning of August, two atomic bombs existed. That was it. So they'd done the test in July, and that was on a platform. They were not dropped from a plane. But two existed that had been created in New Mexico, and that's all they had. So they were worried that if they used up one, they'd, you know, they've used up half their supply. Uh, the second part of that is that they were also worried about who would be the witnesses to this. Who could they bring in? close enough to witness it, and would they relay that back to the Japanese emperor and how reliable they would be? And the final thing they were also worried about was that it might not work. It, you know, they succeeded in New Mexico, but if they did this and it didn't work, then the Japanese wouldn't believe them at all. So they were pretty worried about that. Okay, our final option, and we know this is what happened, so it's a little harder to approach this, but what, is the, what was, in Truman's eyes anyway, and, and in your eyes, what were the advantages and disadvantages of actually dropping the bomb on eventually Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Uh, 
So what were the advantages and disadvantages of this particular approach? People would die. Yeah, a lot of casualties, right? That's the big, that's a big issue. Thousands of casualties. What else? Think of, think of Truman's goals. What were Truman's goals? It would end the war. To end the war, right? So this of the four options, Truman felt like this had the best chance to end the war quickly. They weren't, he didn't necessarily think they would surrender right away, actually. They were quite surprised that they got the surrender by the 1st of September, but they did feel like it would end the war sooner. Anything else? What's a, what was another huge disadvantage that we didn't know about at the time? Outside of the immediate casualties. Radioactivity? Yeah, radioactivity, radiation, excellent. Now, it's, largely that wasn't really understood by the scientists at the time. Um, and so that was something that they couldn't really consider completely. Um, but certainly it became very apparent very fast that that was a huge disadvantage. So, but Truman, he saw that as the way to save American lives and to end the war quickly. So of those four options, he felt like that was the, the best approach. You guys did a great job with that. I'm going to show you some other um, advantages and disadvantages we didn't cover just to make sure we kind of round this out um, as we go through. But those are the options he faced. Now, I'm, on my screen, the red is a little hard to read, but I'm in a very bright room, but I'm hoping that you can, you can read these. So we're going to go back to the first one, the continue the conventional bombing. That was seen as a very safe approach, right? We talked about that, that it was safe, um, that it might lead to a negotiated peace because there was no, you know, there wasn't the use of the atomic bomb here. Um, it's seen as being more humane, maybe less loss of life. So there was, those in those, those white um, bullets um, are the advantages, if you hadn't figured that out yet. And then the red at the bottom of each list are seen as the drawbacks or the disadvantages. And I would encourage you, you know, I'm going to share this with the teachers to look at these and you could add to these lists or, or debate some of these, whether you think that they deserve to be on the list um, as kind of an exercise to see, you know, the things that are weighed into any kind of decision. So the disadvantage was, would be seen that the war would probably continue. Um, there would be more casualties over the long term because you continue to bomb and continue to bomb. And if you look at some of the bombing casualties of Tokyo and some of the fire bombings in Europe, like in Dresden and things like that, where certainly casualties were very high, that there might be a stalemate. There might not be a surrender. It might continue to drag on. And then eventually public opinion comes into this and that the public opinion eventually becomes tired of the war if it, if it drags on too long. So those are kind of the pros and cons of that first one the continuing the conventional bombing. The land invasion has a couple of points I wanted to get back to, so we'll get to these at this point. So the land invasion, the surrender was possible eventually, right? We talked about that, how that may well lead to surrender if you invade Japanese homeland. Although there were casualties, there may well be less casualties than using the atomic bomb. And as on the last student mentioned, with the use of the atomic bomb, of course you had radiation, with the land invasion, there's certainly no, no radiation threat. There probably are more American casualties, almost certainly, with a land invasion, and, and you know a lot of different calculations have been made about that. The next part, though, is, is something we haven't discussed and what I referred to a little bit earlier, and, that, and that's the second and third of the red ones. Japanese defenses were stronger than they thought, and the Japanese defenses were in, the, in exactly the areas where the land invasion was actually going to take place. So one of the things that happened in the summer of 1945 is that the Americans actually started to break the codes of the Japanese military. And when they were able to do that, they were able to discover um, the buildup of Japanese troops. And coincidentally or not, we don't know, 
Um, the Japanese troops were built up right in the areas where the American forces were planning to land um, with the land invasion plans. And so the buildup of troops, usually the American military would like a ratio of three to one to secure victory. And in some places it was more like two to one and even one to one. And in fact, the Japanese Air Force deemed to be um, decimated was actually built up more than they realized, three times more than they realized once they um, got access to the Japanese military codes in that summer of 1945. And so the U US military itself, the army and the Navy began to disagree about the effectiveness of a land invasion. And so there was never a clear message to Truman that that should be the way forward. Again, public opinion, if it did drag on and you had land invasions and heavy casualties, public opinion could be um, could be affected there. Okay, let's move on just in terms of time. And again, the stalemate was possible is that last one, because if you did do the land invasion, but then it got bogged down, like we saw a few years later in say the Korean War, then that would lead to a stalemate. And then our last two options, um, the demonstrating the bomb on the island, we've actually talked through quite a bit of this already, but just as a reminder, it might cause the surrender. Um, it would certainly be less radiation and there would, no, no lives lost could probably be added to that. Um, so these lists are not all an ex exclusive. You could certainly add to them. I mentioned the fact that the prisoners of war could be moved into that area, that the technology might not work. We discussed that also. We only had two two bombs in existence at that time. There was a third bomb in production, but that wasn't going to be available until late mid to late August, about August 19th, if I remember correctly. Um, there was also threats to the crews themselves, to the bomber crews. Would they be fired upon if they said, you know, we're going to be flying a bomb in to, to drop this bomb on a particular island? Would those bombing crews be be under fire, be under threat? And as we mentioned already, who would be a witness? Who would be provide credible evidence to the Japanese leadership? And then the last one we talked about, of course, is what Truman did, which is to drop the bomb on an inhabited Japanese city. And that did, in Truman's eyes, um, end the war quickly, save American lives, and, and surrender was likely. There was another issue there that seemed to be important to Truman, and that is the idea of revenge for Pearl Harbor. So that Truman mentions that in some of his letters, when people question him for his actions, he often refers back to Pearl Harbor as kind of one of his motivations. So that shouldn't be forgotten there. We do know these massive uh, losses of life. The devastating loss of life was certainly a huge outcome. And radiation is at the bottom there that one of the students mentioned there, the radiation and the after effects. Those are the two areas that we discussed already. The other two um, we haven't really discussed, but it's, it kind of makes sense when you look at those. The fact that the United States would lose the moral high ground because they're the first country to use the atomic bomb and still are um, the only country to ever use it against another country. So you lose your moral high ground and you're seen as the aggressor in that, in that uh, particular situation. Let's go forward here. So I'm going to skip back to the video so you guys can see me because I wanted to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and you should be able to see me. So based on that, and we have a few minutes, I think, um, what questions do you have? Maybe if we do one classroom at a time or things that people wanted to bring up, but any questions for me? I see Miss uh, Mrs. Sparlin's class on my screen. So if you have any questions from there, and then we'll switch to Mr. Frost's class in a few minutes. So any questions from Mrs. Sparlin's class? This is your opportunity to ask anything about President Truman and this, this momentous decision. If somebody could repeat the question, I could just make that out. What would have happened had the Japanese not surrendered? What would, that's a really good question. What would have happened if the Japanese had not surrendered? Um, it's very hard to speculate 
um, what would have happened. I think that um, with the third atomic bomb in creation, I wonder about whether they would have used the third bomb after the, they'd used the first two. So that's really, but I, you know, that's speculation. There's really no documentary evidence of what they would have done next, to be honest with you. Uh, I think the surrender came pretty quickly and kind of surprised the US military and, and, and Truman. Um, I will say that Truman took the power of the of the the decision to use the atomic bomb back into the presidency. Let me explain what I mean by that. It's a little complicated. Initially, when the military provide to him the information that the test has been successful, Truman basically says to the military, you have your new new weapon, go ahead and use it. So there wasn't a second decision for Nagasaki, it was use the weapon. And they used the weapon on Hiroshima and then they used the weapon on Nagasaki and they could have continued to do that as the bombs were developed. But after Truman got the initial reports of the amount of devastation, he then hauled that back and said from now on, it needs to be the president that makes that decision for the use of that weapon because it, it was so devastating in its, in its use. So there were not two decisions, there was only one. He basically said, use the technology, use this new weapon, but then brought it back after they saw the devastation. Let's go to Mr. Frost's class. Do we have any questions there? It's actually Mrs. Jump though. I'm sorry, I'm seeing Mr. Frost on the screen, so I apologize. But any questions from that classroom? I think I th it's Mrs. Johnson's class. I think uh, Steve Frost signed us up. So I think that's why the kids are confused. It's that's okay. <laughs> I apologize. But go ahead and ask any questions that you might have. Any questions at all? Yes. <laughs> Did President Truman immediately get along with Churchill? Did, can you repeat the question? Did Truman get along with Churchill when they first met? Uh, actually, no, uh, not initially. They became very close friends later in life and really before the end of the conference. Initially, they didn't really get along. Part of that was their different lifestyle. Truman gets up very early every day, goes for a walk, and goes to bed very early. Churchill's the opposite. He was a late riser, stayed up late, uh, drank cocktails late into the night, and, and was kind of a night owl, whereas Truman was the reverse. And so there were times where um, Truman would have, want to have a meeting with Churchill, and Churchill would still be in bed, or Churchill would come over to visit with him later at night and Truman had gone to bed. So their kind of their lifestyles are pretty different. But over time, they became very close friends. And you might recall uh, Truman, Churchill event later on in 1946, a year later, uh, makes his Iron Curtain speech um, talking about how communism has descended across Europe and an Iron Curtain has fallen down. That was actually in Missouri um, about a couple of hours uh, east of here, and Truman went with him on the train to that to uh, listen to him deliver that speech. So they did become close friends later. We have gifts in our museum that Churchill uh, was a painter and painted uh, things for Ch for Truman and gave him gifts and so forth. So they didn't get along at first, but eventually they became very good friends. It's actually kind of the opposite of Truman and Stalin. At first, Truman thought Stalin was someone he could deal with. His first letter to his wife from the Potsdam Conference, he says, I like Stalin, I can deal with him. But within a, about a week or 10 days, he had changed his mind and realized that Stalin was not negotiating. Um, and so he changed his mind on Stalin very, very quickly. Good question. Either classroom, any other questions or questions from the teachers? earlier was 
if Truman had to deal with the issues that we're having today with North Korea, how do you think he'd handle it? With North Korea? Yeah, I mean, as you know, he got involved in the Korean War after the North Korean invasion of South Korea. I think he would do what he did back then, and that is get the United Nations involved. The one pe thing people often forget with the Korean War is that it was in United Nations action, and he didn't, although there were calls for him to uh, go into China, once troops had gone into North Korea, he resisted that. MacArthur wanted him to use the atomic bomb and really escalate to a third world war. And he very much wanted to um, just maintain South Korean independence. And I think he would probably continue that policy. It's interesting that Korean War armistice that was settled in 1953 is still in place today. That's the same border that they're arguing about today. The demilitarized zone still exists. So I think he would have wanted to try and maintain the independence of South Korea, but try not to get other countries surrounding like China and Russia involved. Uh, as you know, China got involved in the Korean War, but Truman tried to keep them out of it as long as he could and tried not to escalate it. I would think he would try not to escalate the problem, and I think he would try and get the United Nations more involved. I'm not really going to comment politically on the situation today. But I don't see the United Nations involved as much as they were in 1950. I hope that's a fair answer. Perfect. That's a great question. Any questions on, on either Truman and the atomic bomb question or, or anything related to his, his life or presidency? Why didn't they wait to drop the first two until the third was developed? Why did they? Well, I mean, they, they, once you once you start developing them, they've done that successful test in July. Then they just started creating them. So I think as soon as they had one, they were ready to go. And they knew there was going to be another in late August, and then there may be another one after that. But they were anxious to get the war over as quickly as possible. Every day that went by, thousands of American lives are being lost. So in Truman's eyes, as soon as it was ready in that July test that we saw the documentation, he'd made up his mind it was going to be used before August 10th. So as soon as it was available, it was kind of like, it's hard to get into the mindset of 1945. It's a new technology. You're at war and the scientists say, here's a new weapon, a new machine gun, a new, I mean, it seems blasé to say it that way, but here's a new weapon. Truman didn't think twice about not using it. As soon as it was available, he wanted to use it because his goal was to end the war as quickly as possible. Another, that was another really good question. Any other final questions before we wrap things up? I know time is getting close on the hour, but here's your opportunity. If the two atomic bombs didn't work, would Truman continue to continue? Would would Truman continue bombing or would he invade? Or what would he do? If they didn't work, if they did not work, if they did not work, I would imagine that they probably would have got to go back to their land invasion plans that they had. So that, yeah, if they had not worked, they probably would have had the scientists go back to the drawing board to fix whatever was wrong. Uh, but at the same time, they may well have gone forward with their land invasion if they had not worked. They were pretty reluctant to do that. And in fact, the Navy was arguing against that because they felt like the casualty rates were going to be too high because of the, the ratio of troops that they were going to face. But they probably wouldn't have been left with little choice. Good question. Any final questions? Anything the teachers would like to ask? In terms of resources, I wanted to remind you that on the Truman Library website, trumanlibrary.org, if you click on documents, you can see document collections related to a number of Truman decisions. One of them is on the decision of the atomic bomb. You can see all of those documents I used today. But you can also see lots of other things. Korean War was brought up, Marshall Plan, Truman Doctrine, um, and other aspects of the Truman presidency. We also actually have information related to Truman and World War I. 
So if you're looking at 100 years ago to World War I, we actually have a number of World War I materials online as well. You can see all of Harry Truman's letters to his wife. We have 1,300 letters to his wife from 1910 to 1957, all digitized, all with transcripts, so you can read the text of those letters. And some of those he wrote to her from Potsdam. He wrote to her from France in World War I. And every government decision he made, he would write to his wife about his decision making. So you can really get a great personal insight into his thought process as he makes those decisions as president. We have one more question. Okay. Go, Christian. Um, how is America able to get away with using the atomic bombs with little to no repercussion? When after World War I, the use of chemical warfare was banned by the United Nations when the atomic bomb used the power of atoms, which is technically considered. That's a really great question. You know, I think the one one answer to that would be the victor gets the spoils because there were war crimes trials after World War II and the Nazis were put on trial. Um, and so in some ways, some, some might argue that the victor gets the spoils, that you get to dictate the terms. Um, although chemical weapons were used in World War I, there were never any war crime trials about the chemical weapons that were used. So they were frowned upon, but there were no trials um, or anything like that against countries that use chemical weapons. After World War II, there were war crimes trials against the Japanese and against the Germans, primarily for the Holocaust on the German side. Um, and you can look at those. We have those, inf we have those war crimes trials information on the Truman Library website as well. Um, so part of that is the victor gets the spoils. They get to dictate the terms. But two is that Unfortunately, part of your question was flawed. Those that used chemical warfare in the First World War were not tried for those, what would be considered today a war crime. They were not considered at that time to be a war crime. And that would be the same with the atomic bomb. At that time, that would not be considered a war crime. Things have changed. So a good question, a very thoughtful question. But um, in terms of the context of the times, that was not considered. Japanese surrender right after the dropping of the Why? I think mostly the absolute devastation of those cities. When you look at the reports and the photographs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they didn't know whether we had how many more bombs we had. So to them, it could have been an unlimited arsenal. But the absolute devastation of those cities, they were flattened completely. Um, the, they felt like they had no... Um, there was no no future without surrender. I would say as a, as a research aspect to that, to look at how United States and Japanese relations have been um, mended or re, um, look, look at how the United States and the Japanese relationships is today. Um, President Truman's grandson, Clifton Truman Daniel, is still alive. He lives in Chicago. And he does peace missions to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and is working with the Japanese people on peace initiatives between the United States and the Japanese peoples. We have Japanese delegations coming here. Um, we had a Jap Japanese delegation here presenting us a um, paper crane that was made by a survivor of Hiroshima. And so there are peace initiatives between the two. Independence Missouri has sister cities in Japan and so those peace initiatives show you that even out of the most devastating atomic bomb ever used in world history, that those two countries can still get along 75 years later. Any final thoughts? Why didn't the Japanese surrender after the first bomb? There was very little time between the two. I think they were probably still considering that, but after the second one, it, the word came very quickly. There was no, there was no communication from the Japanese to the United States between the first and the second, but after the second one, the, the communication became very quickly. They may have thought the first one was isolated, but after the second one, then there was a thought, well, they may have many more. 
So it was they were unclear about that, and so they surrendered fairly quickly after that. Great questions, everybody. I want to thank you for your participation. I hope it's been helpful. Um, the coordinators have my email address, and I gave you the website address. I can read my email address to the teachers. If anybody has any follow-up questions, I'd be glad to answer them. My email address is mark.adams at nara.gov, and I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint slide so you can see that. Um, so you can see that clearly. So if anybody has questions, you can ask me any questions via email. Teachers, you can do. Students, you can do that individually. You don't have to go through the teacher if you want to maintain your privacy. And trumanlibrary.org is our website where you can find more documents to do more research on these issues. So thank you very much, everybody.